Hello, I'm David, and thank you for selecting this video. I want to present you guys with a challenging dilemma. Imagine that you lived in the first century, during the Roman Empire, and you had to write a letter to your relatives to warn them that a terrible disaster was headed their way. And you wanted to warn them so that they could prepare and be strong and overcome it. Now imagine that these relatives lived in the 21st century. They were hardcore skeptics and wouldn't believe your warning unless you could prove it scientifically. They spoke different languages and lived in a completely different culture. Think of how impossible it would be to write this message. What I have to show you is truly amazing because it explains how God overcame this impossible challenge. He found a 21st century solution to prove to us he wrote the book of Revelation. Think of Revelation, all of it, like you would a royal decree. The first thing a king or queen does after they write a royal decree is seal it with wax and a royal ring. Friends, the book of Revelations has its own built-in royal seal. This seal is chapter 4. Instead of using wax and a ring, God uses something far more spectacular. He uses his creation, the cosmos. That's what this video is going to demonstrate, using simple illustrations. Allow me to explain. Even though a lot has changed in 2,000 years, one thing hasn't, the cosmos. The sun, the moon, the planets and stars, they all follow the exact same rules and order as they did 2,000 years ago. Think about it. A day is still 24 hours. One year is still 365 days. We still observe a seven-day week. But a lot has changed in 2,000 years. God knew how far our science would bring us. He knew we'd learn how to engineer life, create artificial intelligence, and build horrifically destructive weapons. He also knew that unless he intervened, we would not only destroy ourselves, but the earth and all life on it. So you can kind of see why the events in the book of Revelation must happen. That's because Revelations isn't only about judgment and punishment. It's also about intervening and saving. And since God is fair and merciful, he devised a way to warn us in a language that we can't pollute with our political or religious biases. This language is the cosmos. God uses the order and predictability of the cosmos like a king would use a royal seal to prove to our skeptical minds that he wrote the book of Revelation and that the warnings are legitimate. I really want to show you how he does this, but I need to briefly explain the setting where the book of Revelation was written, the Greek island of Patmos. Patmos is a tiny rocky island in the Aegean Sea that's about 34 miles off the coast of Turkey. What you're seeing in this photo is the legendary location where John was visited by the angel of Jesus and given the book of Revelation. In the first few chapters, this angel gives John a divine vision and tells him to write down what he's seeing and send it to the following seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These churches were located in a region of the world we now call Turkey. The angel calls these churches seven lampstands because their purpose was to shine light with the brightness of seven combined lamps. The light was his message and teachings. In the fourth chapter of this book, the angel gave John undeniable proof that God has a 21st century knowledge of our cosmos. This knowledge is far more advanced than any knowledge Greek astronomers had 2,000 years ago. I say this because in chapter 4, John is given a vision of what the sky would look like if he were standing inside the Arctic Circle. This is a location on the planet John had no idea existed. Let me show you what I mean. In the beginning of chapter 4, John says he looks up and he sees an open door in heaven. Then he hears a voice that says, come up here. At once, John says he was in the spirit and he sees a glorious throne and one seated on the throne. Imagine a giant throne hovering over the top of the earth. 
John says the one who's sitting on this throne looks like jasper and carnelian. In other words, they look like the colors red and orange. Then John says, around this throne is a rainbow that looks like an emerald. If you have ever seen the Northern Lights, you are no doubt dazzled by the curtain of emerald green that circles all the way around the top of the earth, just like a halo. This incredible light show is caused by the sun's radiation colliding with the earth's magnetic field. This magnetic field protects the earth from the sun's harmful radiation. Now while these two forces battle it out over our heads, a spectacular display of emerald green like a rainbow is put on display all the way around the top of the earth. Above this emerald rainbow are waves of oranges and reds like jasper and carnelian. What John is seeing on the top of the earth is a magnetic storm and it looks exactly like this gemstone arrangement of jasper, carnelian, and emerald. The nation of Israel had 12 tribes. Carnelian is the gemstone of the first tribe and jasper is the gemstone of the last tribe. If you read the book of Revelation, the angel of Jesus calls himself the first and the last. That's because his message, his teachings, are meant to rule over the earth, including all 12 tribes of Israel. The gemstone of the fourth tribe is an emerald. The name of this tribe is Judah. Jesus belongs to this tribe, the Emerald Tribe. The symbolism of an emerald surrounding the throne like a rainbow means that Jesus, the tribe of Judah, is protecting this divine seat of honor in the same way that the magnetic field protects the entire earth. At first glance, it seems odd to picture God's throne hovering over the earth's north pole. It's obvious there isn't a literal throne up there. But remember, Jesus is showing John symbolic imagery. You could ask the question, is John seeing the southern lights at the south pole? I think this is unlikely because it really doesn't fit the poetry. Thrones don't rule from under a kingdom. Also, it's clear at the beginning of chapter 4, John was told to come up here. God is doing this because he's trying to tell us in the 21st century to come up to the top of the earth and see this vision for ourselves. This is not the first time in the Bible God's throne is positioned in the north. In the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel saw a very similar vision of God's throne and it appears as a storm coming out of the north. The storm Ezekiel sees also represents God's impending wrath. But this time, his wrath is primarily directed at the nation of Israel. So here we have our first proof that the book of Revelation is indeed for the 21st century. This proof is God's throne ruling over the earth. And like the earth's magnetic field, God is defending it from annihilation. Next, John looks around and sees 24 thrones circling God's throne. And seated on these thrones are 24 elders, dressed in white robes with golden crowns on their heads. John was an observant Jew, and there were 24 priestly clans that served in the Temple of Jerusalem. These 24 elders could also represent the 12 sons of Jacob, combined with the 12 disciples of Jesus. The identity of these 24 elders is unclear. However, the symbolic symbolism is undeniable. These 24 elders represent a 24-hour day, but not just any day, a unique day from within the Arctic Circle. This is a location first century Christians had no clue about. This is a location where the day is crowned with 24 hours of golden sunlight. During the summer months, the Arctic region at the top of the earth faces the sun. Even though the earth is rotating, the sun stays above the horizon all day and all night for 24 hours of continuous sunlight. When you go further up to the North Pole, this golden crown of sunlight lasts a continuous six months. Let me demonstrate this with Stellarium. This is a free software planetarium that you can download on your computer. Using Stellarium, we can position ourselves inside the Arctic Circle at the North Pole. 
in March, the sun starts rising above the horizon, but it doesn't set at the end of the day. It just keeps rising and rising until it reaches its highest point in June. Then it gradually drops back down below the horizon in September. So from March all the way to September, the sun's golden crown is visible for 24 hours a day. Each hour in the day is given a throne. That's 24 thrones. The elders represent time, 24 hours. The golden crowns they all wear represent 24 hours of continuous sunlight. And their white robes are represented by the blanket of snow that covers the extreme regions in the north. Now I want to show you something that proves beyond any reasonable doubt that God is talking to the 21st century. If you're standing on the North Pole and you look out at the horizon, the horizon is zero degrees. The highest point the sun reaches in the summer is 24 degrees above the horizon. That means these 24 thrones are literally sitting 24 degrees below God's throne with 24 hours of golden daylight crowned on top of them. So just like the magnetic field that protects the earth, we're seeing another proof that authenticates this vision is divine and is being seen from the North Pole. You might say, yeah, but the Arctic North also has 24 hours of darkness in the winter. Well, I want you to hang in there and I'll address this in a moment. John then says in the next verse, Coming from the throne are flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. When mentioned in the Bible, thunder and lightning symbolize God's power, justice, and wrath. But depicting his throne with thunder and lightning seems contrary to his nature. For example, Psalms 103 verse 8 declares that, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Symbolically, the weather up in the Arctic is like God's throne. That's because thunderstorms are rare in this remote region. They happen everywhere else with regularity. But at the North Pole, thunderstorms are very rare. For example, between 1915 and the year 2000 in Barrow, Alaska, which is located within the Arctic Circle, they only had seven reported thunderstorms. That's less than one per decade. Here's a report from June 2000 by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. A rare event, a thunderstorm moved through the Barrow area on the 20th. Many calls were received at the weather office from people who have just witnessed their first thunderstorm and lightning display. However, in the last 10 to 20 years, thunderstorms have been observed deeper and deeper into the Arctic region especially in the past few years. So, in a symbolic sense, the Arctic region, where the throne is typically restful, is no longer slow to anger. It's angry. Lightning and thunderstorms from the throne is precision imagery that conveys the king is about to inflict wrath on his rebellious kingdom. This is yet another proof the book of Revelation is a divine message for the world today. Next, John says, In front of the throne burn seven lamps of fire, which are the sevenfold spirits of God. Think of these lamps of fire like the chandelier in your dining room. A chandelier with seven lights is the same as saying one chandelier, or a candelabra. In the first century, the Hebrew temple had one of these candelabras. They called it the menorah. This menorah was a light that had seven branches. This lamp symbolized God's light and it was the only source of light in the whole temple. They placed this lamp on the south side, or in other words, on the south side of God's throne. Think of God's sevenfold spirit in the same way you would think of a candelabra. It has seven individual fires or qualities. When combined, these fires form one light. In the Bible, the prophet Isaiah identified these qualities in such a way that they perfectly mirror the design of the menorah. This is what Isaiah says, There shall come forth a stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. 
Now I'm going to show you how these seven flames are represented in our cosmos. Most of you are familiar with the seven days of creation in Genesis. Seven is a number that represents completeness. On the first day, God created light. On the seventh day, he rested. These seven flaming lamps are a symbolic expression of one complete week. Just like there are 24 hours in a day, there are seven days in a week. To the ancient Hebrews, these seven days were represented by seven lights or flames in the sky. These seven lights are the sun, the moon, and the five planets that can be seen with the naked eye. The sun being the source of light, followed by the celestial bodies that reflect the light. The moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Although these planets look like stars to most people today, our ancient ancestors knew they did not behave like stars. That's why these planets were given honorable status and included in the names of the week. Of the five planets, Saturn is the farthest away, so it takes it the longest to travel around the sun. That's why it's the last day of the week, because it's restful. Isn't it poetic though that the Sabbath is on Saturday, the last day of the week, but Jesus was resurrected to life on Sunday, the first day of our week, which is named after the sun, the source of light in our solar system. Do you remember when I pointed out that the menorah sat on the south side of the Hebrew temple? Well, when you're standing on the northern hemisphere, the sun, moon, and planets are all on the southern side just like the seven flaming lamps burning before the throne. These seven flames perfectly mirror the seven churches and the seven lampstands I mentioned earlier. Their purpose was to also shine light with the brightness of seven combined lamps. When the angel of Jesus appeared to John, he told him that he walks among the seven lampstands. Remember, his throne is ruling over the earth, and before his throne are seven lamps of fire. Therefore, if he is walking or moving among these lamps, the earth is walking or moving among the sun, the moon, and the five planets. In the first century, everyone thought that the earth was the center of the universe and that these celestial lamps moved around it. This is another confirmation that Jesus is talking to us in the 21st century. He knows that the earth is walking around the sun along with the other celestial lamps. Can you see what an astonishing miracle all of this is? God is masterfully linking all this symbolism together to prove to us that he has a 21st century understanding of the cosmos. The next verse in chapter 4 says that there is something like a sea of glass, like crystal before the throne. The Arctic Ocean covers five and a half million cubic square miles. It goes directly over the North Pole, so technically it's under and before the throne. And like crystal, when water freezes, it forms ice crystals. A vast portion of the Arctic Ocean is frozen, even during the summer months. The phrase, sea of glass, also implies smooth and calm. This sharply contrasts the angry throne above it. This poetical pairing is intentional, and the symbolism is a precise picture of the frozen Arctic Ocean and the frequent thunderstorms that are now occurring over the North Pole. This is yet another divine proof God is speaking to us. It's not only precise, I don't see how a person living in the first century could have coincidentally imagined it. After the sea of glass, chapter 4 goes on to say that around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and back. As I identify these creatures, I want you to try hard to imagine them covered with eyes from front to back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. The ancient Hebrews were a farming society. The Bible has several references and parables about farming. That's because the Hebrews had a close relationship with the land and with God. The book of Genesis tells us that the moon, the sun, and the stars were used to help them identify the time of year for planting and harvesting, and to identify religious festivals. The book of Job even mentions Orion and the bear constellations. Think of these constellations like you would the nations on the earth. They're communities of people defined by borders. 
The stars are the communities, and the bigger the community, the brighter the star. Twelve of these constellations were given special names. That's because the sun, the moon, and the planets travel through them. These twelve constellations are just like the twelve hours on a clock, the sun being the hour hand. The sun's position in a constellation will tell you what month it is, just like the hour hand on a clock will tell you what hour it is. Can you see how this would help you if you were farming? You could just look up in the sky and know if it was the beginning, middle, or end of the spring, just like a clock tells you when it's time to go to work or go to bed. Each season has a month to identify its beginning, middle, and end. The middle of summer is marked when the sun travels through the constellation Leo the Lion. When the sun travels through Taurus the Ox, it's the middle of the spring. Aquarius, the water-bearing man, is midwinter. Winter is a rainy season in the Mediterranean. And Scorpius the scorpion is mid-fall. And since the scorpion's sting causes death, this seems like an appropriate way to represent the end of the growing season. I'm showing you these constellations as they appear in the night sky over Jerusalem. But something astonishing happens if we position ourselves over the North Pole. From above the North Pole, which is God's symbolic throne, you can see the lion and you can see the ox, but look what happens with Aquarius, the water bearer. You can only see his face. If we were in the Mediterranean area, like Patmos or Jerusalem, you can see the whole body of Aquarius, but from the North Pole, you can only see his face. Now look what happens if we move a little more clockwise. We can't see the scorpion, the constellation that represents the season that brings death. In other words, you can't see death from God's throne. It's too far below the horizon. But look what's above it, Aquila, the flying eagle. From the North Pole, you can see the four living creatures precisely as they are described in the book of Revelation. I don't even know how to calculate the odds that this imagery is just a coincidence. Again, here's Leo, the constellation that looks like a lion. Then we have the constellation that looks like an ox. This here is the face of Aquarius, the water-bearing man. And finally, the constellation that literally is called the flying eagle, all in the exact same order. God is symbolically showing his believers what the horizon looks like if you're standing on the North Pole. This is a place that's so remote and treacherous that many people have died trying to be the first to get there. The first successful and verifiable expedition occurred in 1926. John is seeing symbolism from a position that we couldn't even get to until the 20th century. If you're like me, you might be wondering, why is John seeing the living creatures in a reverse order of the seasons? Summer, spring, winter, fall. If you think about it, John is seeing time exactly the way 21st century believers see time. It's clockwise. If you look at these constellations in a clockwise order, we also get a vivid illustration of Jesus Christ's ministry on earth. Jesus is the regal lion of Judah. He stepped off his heavenly throne to become a light to guide us in darkness. He surrendered his life as a sacrificial ox for our sins. Then he brought to humanity the Holy Spirit's living waters. Finally, he overcame the sting of the scorpion and he ascended into heaven like the flying eagle. To top it all off, he left his mark in the sky right above the flying eagle. Do you see this cluster of stars? It's famously known as the Northern Cross. Its position is perfectly placed. After John identifies the four living creatures, he sees that they each have six wings and are full of eyes all around and inside. Remember I asked you to imagine these creatures covered in eyes from front to back? Well, now John is saying the wings are full of eyes all around and on the inside. There is only one way this could even make sense. First, let's address the six wings. There are six cardinal directions that help us define and locate objects in three-dimensional space. These directions are up, down, north, south, east, and west. This is telling us that the living creatures have wings extending in every direction, occupying vast regions in space. To enhance and confirm this, John says that the wings have eyes all around and 
inside. These eyes are in addition to the eyes that cover the creatures in the front and back. This is a precise picture of what the universe is like. Each one of these constellations in the front and the back and all around in every direction contain billions upon billions of stars. First century astronomers using the naked eye could only see about 10,000 stars on a clear night. This is another royal seal type of proof that chapter 4 was not written by human hands. The next verse says, Day and night, without ceasing, the living creatures sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God the Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. What I'm about to show you is something that is so profound that after seeing this, if you don't believe that this is a message from God through His Son Jesus Christ, it might be that you just really don't want to believe it. And now here's why I say this. I have spent all this time talking about the Arctic region and the North Pole. Well, it doesn't seem fair to leave out its biggest celebrity, the star Polaris. If you were standing directly on the North Pole, and then you looked directly above you, you'd see the star Polaris. There's a name for the position that's directly over your head. It's called the zenith. So if you're out in your backyard at nighttime, the star directly over your head is called the zenith star. If you were to hang out there for a couple of hours, you'd notice that the star moved towards the west. That's because the earth is rotating. And just like the sun is moving over the sky in the day, the stars move over your head at night. The star Polaris is very special though. It's special because it doesn't appear to move. Everything that's in the sky moves, except Polaris. If you're standing anywhere in the Mediterranean, or anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, you'll see all the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, they all move. But Polaris, up in the north, remains fixed in one place, day or night. That's why Polaris is the gold standard if you're using the stars to navigate. Now I want to show you what it looks like if you're standing on the North Pole and Polaris is directly over your head. Everything in the sky will look like it's revolving around Polaris. It would be like standing in the middle of a merry-go-round and looking up. Now Polaris is special because the Earth doesn't always have a pole star. It's actually rare. If you could somehow stand on the North Pole 2,000 years ago and you looked up, guess what? Polaris would not be there. That's because the Earth didn't have an official pole star in the first century. This is because as the Earth rotates, there is a very, very slight wobble. Because of this wobble, Polaris gradually moves over our North Pole. This movement is so gradual, it takes several hundred years just to notice it. As you can see here, Polaris really hasn't been a true pole star until recently. In the next hundred years, it'll pass over our North Pole and eventually lose its official throne. But don't fret because in 26,000 years, Polaris comes full circle and returns back to its rightful position. This means that the Earth only gets a true pole star about once every 26,000 years. So just like this verse says, Polaris was and is and will be again our pole star. Now, if you're wondering how deep does this symbolism go, the answer is approximately 400 light years. That's because if you had a high power telescope, you'd see that Polaris isn't one star. It's a triple star system. These three stars are so far away, they appear as one combined light, representing the Father, the Son, and the sevenfold spirit. So these living creatures are being very literal when they sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Polaris is a trinity of stars that was and is and is to come. Now to me, this royal seal of proof is like God hammering in the last nail into a perfectly crafted house of symbolic imagery. And even without all the symbolism, the North Pole is an incredibly unique place on Earth to be standing, if you could get there. It would appear as though the entire universe was revolving around you. This truly is the perfect place for God to symbolically position His throne. 
Now I'm going to read the last three verses all at once because they pull all of these royal seal proofs together and reveal God's profoundly poetic nature. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the 24 elders fall before the one who is seated on the throne and worship the one who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne singing, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Let me show you why these verses tie everything together. And by the way, this is my favorite part. Do you remember earlier when I said at the North Pole the sun is visible all day for six months out of the year? That's six months of continuous daylight, blotting out the night sky. That means you can't see the stars giving their praise and glory and thanks. In order to see the living creatures, the sun has to set. Or in other words, the 24 hours of daylight have to kneel and take off their golden crowns of sunlight so that you can see the night sky and the living creatures shining and singing thanks to their creator. The poetry in these last three verses is perfectly crafted and cosmically stunning. What a beautiful way to end this poetic chapter with all the glorious shining stars. If you've been living in urban populated areas that have a lot of light pollution at night, do yourself a favor. Go out into the country wilderness some weekend and gaze upon the splendor of the night sky and never forget your heavenly creator has gone through an incredible effort and ordeal in order to have a relationship with you. Why would he go through all this trouble? Because he does love us. He knows that we live in an age where truth is easily twisted. It's hard to know who or what to believe. Well, chapter 4 is his way of saying you can believe him and believe his warning. The events foretold in this book will happen, and I believe they're already happening. The earth and humanity is experiencing unprecedented changes and hardships. Either we're going to destroy ourselves and the planet, or God is going to intervene. And if you've been paying attention to the current events, an intervention really is our best and only hope. Some of you watching might be thinking, they've been saying the sky is falling for years. And I would absolutely agree, but this callousness is dangerous because trouble almost always hits you on your blind side. I am begging you to take God's warning seriously and turn your attention and passion over to the teachings that Jesus gave us in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So friends and believers, I sincerely want to thank you for watching this video. And I pray God opens your heart to receive his miracle and blessings for you and your family and your friends. God bless.